Chapter 11. Mazarin as a Collector Collectors of the 17th century in France Louis XIII Richelieu Mazarin and his advisers Louis XIV as an art lover Vaillant's strange case Sanson, the hangman, collecting pictures The second collection of Cardinal Mazarin Its partial destruction through the Cardinal's nephew the Médaille Ancelon under Louis the Fourteenth, Epigrams on Collectors, Duke of Orleans' ill-fated collection. We must now give our attention to France as the most prominent country in all that concerns collections of art, because the same conditions appear here that are vanishing from Italy. In the 17th century, Paris had a well-established market of antiquities, authentic and spurious masterpieces, articles of virtu, etc., they were also collectors of all types, dealers and the whole assemblage of wise and foolish, honest and dishonest, peculiar to the commerce when it finds its proper market. Broadly speaking, in the 17th century, every Parisian seems to have been a collector of something or other. Painting as a rule is given the preference. It is about this time that Italy, however rich through the daily excavation of antique works of sculpture, no longer seemed to suffice the greedy demand of France. Perez sent his emissaries to Mount Athos, Syria, and Africa in search of finds. Tavernier, Thévenet, Luca, Chardin, and Gallon scoured the world in quest for antiquities and rarities both for themselves and for the King of France. Vaillant, one of the most efficient of these hunters, went to the east, sent by Louis XIV, who too has joined the ring of collectors and in a kingly way played the role of art amateur. On his return journey, Vaillant was caught by pirates, but managing to escape, embarked for Europe. On the way to France, the vessel for the second time met the Corsairs. They were seen in the distance and were expected to attack at any moment. The ship was able to escape, but fearing to be caught again and of losing the valuable collections of coins and medals he was bringing to Europe, Vaillant swallowed twenty of the best pieces in order to save them from any possible danger of being taken. This odd story, with its consequences, is related in detail by Monsieur Weiss in his Biographie Universelle, with such French frankness as to forbid any attempt at translation. Besides monarchs, the princes, noblemen, and simple middle class of all conditions seem to be collectors at this period. The passion for collecting numbers names such as Richelieu and Mazarin among antiquaries, amateurs, and dealers were Jabach and others. The number and importance of art collections, as well as of intelligent art lovers in France during the 17th century, can be gathered from the many publications on this century. They are many, and most of the contemporary ones are quite documentary and important for the number of collectors they mention. We may quote among them the Itinerarium Galliae, 1612, by Just Zinzeling, a German signing himself Jodocus Sincerus, Abraham Golnitz's Ulysses Belgico Gallico, a work written in 1631 dealing with the collection of medals and painting that the author found in France during his journey. There is also the Voyage pour l'instruction et les commodités tant de François Couleur étranger, printed in 1639 and reprinted by Verdier, with interesting additions, in the year 1687. John Evelyn, the English diarist, visited France in the year 1643 and gave an account of many collections of art and their cabinets, which was partially republished in the Voyage de Liste, in an edition of the year 1878. We can enumerate further the Traité du plus belle bibliothèque, published for the first time in 1644 by Père Louis Jacob, the librarian of Cardinal de Retz and of Président du Halle, the Liste Anonyme des Cueilleurs de Divers Villes, etc. In these works, thousands of names of collectors of art, whether specialists or not, are mentioned. Not only those residing in Paris, but in all towns in the provinces. Collector mania was becoming epidemic. The list of 17th century collectors of art has the odd honour of including the name of Charles Sanson, the hangman of Paris, and great-grandfather of the celebrated Sanson, the executioner of the haute oeuvre at the time of the French Revolution. According to information given by Gramont, who related to the French king his adventures with Sanson, 
the man who had been nominated public executioner in Paris by a decision of Parliament dated August 11th, 1688, possibly the first Saint-Saëns to enter the undesirable profession, this man was not only a collector of paintings, but also a specialist, and logically so. Gramont relates how he was one day hunting for paintings in the fair of Saint-Germain, when he came across Saint-Saëns with Forrest, a painter and art dealer. The hangman was haggling over the price of a few works he wished to add to his collection. One of the canvases represented a wife mercilessly scourging her husband. Another was the portrait of Monsieur Tardieu, the deceased Lieutenant Criminel, a man Sanson had known very well and to whom he owed a certain gratitude, because, as he remarked to Gramont, when living he had made him hang and torture so many people that his skill and efficiency were gained through the work done in Monsieur Tardieu's time. A third painting he finally decided to buy represented Japanese torturing several missionaries to death. He candidly declared that spectacles of this kind appeared charming to him and that he intended to hang the painting in his bedroom. A characteristic of the latter part of the 17th century is not only the many sales of collections of art in France, England and elsewhere, but the appearance for the first time of printed catalogues, prepared either for the sale or as a simple illustrative document of certain collections. The first printed catalogue of France bears the title Rue de Médaille et autres antiques du cabinet du Monsieur du Perrier, Jean de Lomdex. And after this many collectors followed the example. Even the learned Marot is tempted to give the public his catalogue de livres d'estampes et de figures de taille douce. To complete the characteristics of the revived market of antiques and articles of vertu in France, now exuberant in its various expressions, we may note the advent of the so-called amateur marchand. The private dealer, a gentleman with a collection who deals secretly in antiques, and at the same time plays the grand seigneur scorning commerce, has been perfected since, and the modern one is perhaps more intelligent, shrewder, more the grand seigneur, but less frank and far more dangerous. It may be said, by the way, that the art critic has not yet put in an appearance as a disguised dealer, the wardrobe of the ambiguous trade not having yet supplied the mask. There was no representative at this time for the type of Pietro Aretino, why not call him one of this species, who in the 16th century extolled paintings for artists in exchange for paintings and sold his literary eulogies to princes and monarchs. One of the most characteristic collectors of the epoch is perhaps Mazarin, a merchant and intriguer of the one side, and on the other a passionate collector and an epic type of the lover of art. A brief sketch of his life and the vicissitudes of his collections of art are worth giving. Mazarin, in a way, so thoroughly impersonates his time that to portray him as a collector helps to throw light on the milieu in which he lived. History handed Mazarin down to us as a politician and capital intriguer, etc., but only a few know of him as a lover of art. As a collector, Mazarin recalls the shrewdest kind of the old Roman type. The times are changed, and the old ways of Sulla and Mark Antony no longer possible violence and proscription lists would not be tolerated but without the extreme methods of a roman proconsul mazarin possesses the cunning of a verres like the latter he also finds things by instinct and has the unbounded passion of a true collector we are uncertain at times whether mazarin who was without doubt one of the most appreciative collectors of his day possessed that rare sixth sense which goes under the name of the collector's touch but he was nevertheless a man of taste and an art lover of unusual promptitude in the usage of the abilities of others. Like many a genuine and greedy collector of Roman times, Mazarin was persistent and obdurate in the carrying through of the most complex and discouraging plans in order to secure objects for his collection. In Rome once he saw a painting of Correggio, the Sposa Lisio. It belonged to Cardinal Barberini, who had made up his mind never to part with the masterpiece, to become possessed of it, Mazarin made use of a ruse. He asked Anne of Austria to demand the painting from Cardinal Barberini, knowing that stubborn as the cardinal might be, he would not refuse a favour to the Queen of France. In fact, Barberini came to Paris himself to present the painting to Anne of Austria. The epilogue of this Mazarinade is related by Brienne as follows. 
to do proper honour to the gift the queen hung the picture in her bedroom in the presence of cardinal barberini but hardly had he left il n'eut pas les dos tournés than she took the painting and gave it to mazarin brienne ends his account with the observation that mazarin had conducted this lengthy intrigue to get possession of a picture considering that intriguing was second nature with mazarin we must say that correggio's sposalizio was worth the trouble of such a mazarinade as a collector of art bric-a-brac and precious things generally cardinal mazarin had an unusually lucky career contrary to the rule that exacts a very high price for experience in collecting mazarin seems to have been favoured by fortune from the very first as for scruples if they are known to a few connoisseurs he had none he was scarcely known his profession if his occupation may be so called was to move between rome and paris to play to a certain extent the part of a courier between the two cities the navette weaver's shuttle between the roman state and its intriguers in paris during this period of his life mazarin used to land in the french capital at the house of the chavignes where he often arrived covered all over with dirt tout crotté passing monferrato on one of his journeys he bought a rosary the beads of which were supposed to be glass but were in fact precious stones emeralds sapphires rubies and diamonds the rosary mazarin bought for a mere song was sold in paris for ten thousand ducats his reputation as an excellent bric-a-brac hunter with a fine eye for works of art reached richelieu and this secured mazarin the protection of the omnipotent cardinal the rest is known mazarin really remained a private dealer all his life a fact that his opponents could not forget more than one mazarinade alludes to the cardinal's dealings even when writing to potentates or diplomats on the most important political schemes mazarin never lost sight of his hobby in his letter to cardinal grimaldi on the importance of watching our affairs in italy he reminds him by the way to be on the lookout for good books and good paintings etc through a well-organized network of agents and political friends he received objects for his collection almost daily chiefly from rome florence and other cities of italy statues paintings furniture arrived at a continual stream at the cardinal's palace his library numbered twelve thousand volumes in a very short time the fronde however is no longer satisfied with gibing the cardinal with mazarinades on his buying of books without being able to read them his opponents antagonistic to the cardinal's policy finally rose up boldly against him mazarin was obliged to fly from paris by decree of parliament his goods were seized and sold whatever criticism may be passed on the cardinal's shady policy the destruction of his collection and library is an unpardonable sin and an artistic loss mazarin does not seem to have been discouraged by this unexpected contretemps learning that diabac was going to london to be present at the sale of the collection of charles i he asked him to buy paintings for him and through this friend he was able to secure for a new gallery the venus by titian the antiope and the marsyas by correggio the deluge by caracci as well as tapestries of inestimable value two years later mazarin triumphantly entered paris again was reinstated in his former power and started a new library while reconstituting his dispersed gallery and when he died his collection contained according to an inventory of the year sixteen sixty one five hundred and forty six pictures of which two hundred and eighty three were of the italian school seventy seven german or dutch seventy seven french and a hundred and nine of various schools the italian school included names such as raphael titian correggio tintoretto solario guido reni the caracci domenicino bassano albani etc Many of these works are now in the Louvre Museum, and nearly all his statues, 350 in number, have also passed to the Louvre and are now kept in the Galerie de Antique. The inventory also informs us that the Cardinal left 21 cabinets, some in ebony, others veneered with tortoiseshell and ivory, and a large quantity of marble tables and Venetian glass, chandeliers in rock crystal, and irons in silver or gilded. 
The precious stones were valued at 387,014 francs, the silver of the chapel at 25,995, the plates in silver, gold or gilded, 761 pieces, at 347,972, etc. The same inventory also notes 411 fine pieces of tapestry, estimated at 632,000, perhaps what a single piece of the best would cost nowadays, but an enormous sum considering the time. There were also 46 Persian rugs of unusual length, 21 complete amoublons in velvet, satin, gold embroidered silk, etc. The library included 50,000 volumes and 400 manuscripts. Brienne, who was a collector himself on a smaller scale, and who filled at the time the position of secretary to the cardinal, relates with a certain pathos the last moments of this frantic art collector, and how during his last illness he grieved to leave his cherished masterpieces. I was walking, says Brienne, in the small gallery in which is the woollen tapestry representing Scipio. The cardinal did not possess a finer one. By the noise of his slippers I heard him coming, shuffling along like a suffering man or a convalescent. I hid myself behind the tapestry and heard him say, I must leave all this. Being very weak, he stopped at every step, leaning first to one side and then to the other, gazing at the various objects of his collection. And in a voice that came from his heart, he kept on repeating, I must leave all this, then turning his head to another side, and also that. What trouble I had to buy all these things. How can I leave them without regret? I shall not be able to see them where I am going. I gave a sigh. I could not help it, and he heard me. Who is there? It is I, Monseigneur. Come here, he said to me in a doleful tone. He was nude, only covered with his robe de chambre de camelot, lined with petit cris. He said, Give me your hand. I am so weak. I can hardly bear it. Then returned to his first idea. Do you see, my friend, that fine painting by Correggio, that Venus by Titian, and that incomparable deluge by Caracci? I know that you too love and understand painting. Alas, my dear friend, I must leave all this. Goodbye, dear paintings that I have loved so much, that have cost me so high a price. Prienne, Memoirs, Book 2, Chapter 14 these three paintings, Correggio's Sposalizio, Titian's Venus and Caracci's work, are now in the Louvre Museum. Que j'ai tant aimé et qui m'en tant coûté. The second part of the sad exclamation would indeed seem to belong to this shrewd adventurer, but those not knowing to what length the passion for collecting can go would hardly imagine that a man of Mazarin's temperament could love, really love, anything on earth but power and intrigue. As a most remarkable contrast to this passionate love for beautiful things, destiny ordains that the greater part of the cardinal's statues and paintings should fall into the hands of his nephew and heir, Armand Charles de Laporte, Duc de la Milleray, the husband of Mazarin's niece, Hortense Mancini. This nephew, who on becoming the cardinal's heir was allowed to take his uncle's name and titles, was bigoted to the last degree. Idiotically deprived of all artistic sense, he thought it was his duty to destroy the art collection, to purge the world of the offence offered to morality by nude sculpture, to rid society of the cardinal's paintings with their shocking mythological subjects. saint Evremont relates how this fanatic iconoclast left his mansion at Vincennes one day with the deliberate intention to destroy the fine gallery left to him by the cardinal, and how on his arrival in Paris he entered the place where it was kept, and taking a hammer out of the mason's hand, proceeded to smash statue after statue and destroy paintings. But the statues and works of art were altogether too many to be destroyed single-handed, so he armed half a dozen servants with hammers, and ordered them to help him in his artistic hecatomb. It was indeed fortunate that upon the cardinal's death Louis the Fourteenth made up his mind to buy some of the best paintings and that some of the statues had also been taken away from this strange curator of Mazarin's museum, or there would be very little left today of one of the most famous collections of Paris. Some of the statues now in the Louvre still show this fanatic nobleman's abuse of the hammer, more especially the one bearing the title Le Génie de Repos Éternel. The monarchs of this time bought paintings, statues and fine things, sharing enthusiasm with private citizens. 
however they played their part well and the attitude of the art lover gave them a finishing touch yet in less dangerous and despotic an age the pen of a moliere might have tried its caustic ability on some of these types louis the thirteenth is after all but a mild art lover at least so he appears by the side of marie de medici who learned the part of mycenas at the court of tuscany he collects arms and has a cabinet of choice weapons among other curios his gros vitri a carbine of rare merit left him by vitri we know of this collection of louis the thirteenth because it is recorded that when concini the florentine intriguer whom marie de medici had created marechal d'ancre was killed in the court of the louvre the king who was in his cabinet des armes heard the noise of the pistols anne of austria his wife one of the few women to detest roses and who could not even bear to see this magnificent queen of flowers painted in a picture had a passion for fine book bindings and monsieur gaston d'orlin sported medals and also rare books as for louis the fourteenth the best staged king of his time he was apparently ready to buy anything that would add magnificence to his court and be in keeping with his role of roi soleil notwithstanding his more or less decorative magnificence however this monarch was at times a hard bargainer and like isabel d'est knew how to take advantage of needy or impecunious clients his transactions with yabak to buy from him the finest art collections in france are scandalous nor can these transactions be solely attributed to colbert who was for a long time the go-between in this affair yabach was german by birth and parisian by election a rich banker the director of the compagnie des onze orientales intelligent and a most passionate art collector with great care and expense he had formed the finest collection of his time later through business reverses his unbounded liberality to artists and the extravagant prices he paid for his masterpieces yabach finally found himself forced to part with his collection and entered into negotiations with louis the fourteenth who knew its immense value dealings dragged on for a long time and every day yabach was more pressed by his creditors notwithstanding his necessitous condition he rebelled at the absurd price offered and wrote to colbert to beg the king to treat him as a christian not as a moor finally louis the fourteenth the roi soleil though in this affair a planet certainly that did not shine in generosity gained his point and for the absurdly paltry sum of two hundred thousand livres became the owner of the renowned yabak collection composed of no fewer than a hundred and one paintings a great many of them masterpieces and five thousand five hundred and forty two drawings it is sufficient to say that in this yabak collection were works by leonardo da vinci the saint john the concert champetre by giorgione one of the few authentic works of this master the entombment of christ the pilgrims of emmaus and the mistress of titian by titian all of which now belong to the louvre museum with a king who played the connoisseur and collected objects of art and vertu no gentleman of the french court would acknowledge indifference towards art or be without a certain hobby of his own collecting some one thing in particular being in fact what is generally defined as a specialist speaking of la mode in his les caractères la bruyere lashes the collecting craze of his time without mercy his chapter thirteen treats of fads and fashion and in it he tells of the ridiculous freaks of collectors and cleverly points out how utterly deprived of genuine meaning were the artistic pursuits of such amateurs nevertheless with its good sides and its bad the epidemic spread not only in france but in other countries as well we will however confine our study of this epoch to france as for the purposes of this brief resume of the collecting craze france was ahead of the other countries and thus by the side of the wise and genuine lover of art possessed all the other degrees of collector mania though conforming to fashion every one has his own views of the matter so that there are dreamers and speculators on all kinds of antiques but painting is given the preference pictures are bullion writes the fat coulange to his cold-blooded and well-behaved cousin madame de sevigny you can sell them at twice the price whenever you like 
In fact, during one of his journeys to Italy, Coulanges, who had caught the collecting fever, made a considerable sum of money in buying and selling pictures, so much money that it spoiled his taste for, as a chroniclist said, the treasure which he saw piled up at the Hôtel de Guise awoke in him more expensive tastes. His wife, Marie-Angelique de Guibagnol, collected rate curies. Madame de Sévigné tells us of her delight when she saw in her cousin's house a looking-glass that had been owned by Queen Marguerite. At this epoch the art and curio market comprised all sorts of odd characters, and, as might be expected, the subject gave ample food to writers and chroniclers for skits. La Bruyère is not alone in making sport of the obsessed art collector and crazy curio hunter. From Molière to the Italian Goldoni, the antiquary and his victim are capital subjects. Poetry also contributes its sarcasm. In France, some of the minor and justly obscure poets are very useful in the reconstruction of our milieu. There are even chronicles written in verse. For instance, Marie-Thérèse, the wife of Louis XIV, goes to see Catherine Henriette Billier de Beauvais, the first lady of the bedchamber of the Queen Dowager Anne of Austria, the lady who is evidently collecting art. The poetical chronicle at once informs the public that Mercredi, notre auguste reine, chez madame de beauvais pour le son aimable palais voir les meuvailles étonnantes et ratées surprenantes we will spare the reader the description of the collection given in a sort of litany of praise a sequence of lines like the following tante de belles of fèvre tante de clatante pierrie tante de vases si précieux tante de bust de tante de marge etc le maisel prier de roche is crazy for books and like a true bibliomaniac he never reads his books which are generally bought for the title etc this of course is more than enough for his introduction into one of these rhyming chronicles called rimay le livre de roche en belle couverture mais le maître n'entend science ni lecture paintings being given the preference they are also the cherished subject for verse impassioned specialists who collected the works of a single artist and spend a lifetime in doing it are a capital subject there is also an arcadia among art collectors worthy of the eighteenth century a regular arcadia with pseudo names etc one of these rhymed chronicles records the various names assumed by the collectors and amateurs of the arcadia as we have said many of the collectors of these paintings are specialists possessed of the hobby of collecting the works of a single master Poussin is at one time the most fashionable, and while the Poussinists are among the most impassioned in proclaiming the merits of their artist, there are also other ists. Gamar, Sieur de Crez, Lieutenant de Chasse, is apparently at the head of the Poussinists. His Arcadian name is Pantolm. The widow of Lesco, the jeweller who was one of Mazarin's advisers, and was sent by the cardinal to Spain in search of fine things, collects paintings, but happens to be a Rubenist. However, in due time she is converted by Pantolm, Gamar, to the Poussinist persuasion, and deserts the Flemish art of Rubens, and starts a new collection as a Poussinist. She is called Irene in the Banquet du Cueil. It would take long to go over all the pleasantries of the curio hunters of this time. Bizot, named Lubin, in the Banquet du Curieux, is a type of collector we have already introduced. Lubin, amateur de antiquailles, de livres anciens et de villes médailles, philosophe sans jugement, curieux sans raisonnement. Other old characters have escaped record in rhyme. A Sieur Basson de Limville of Blois is a well-known collector of medals. He spent his whole life in buying nothing but medals. Yet no one ever saw his collection, as as soon as they were bought, the medals were put away in his cabinet, declares an informant of the time. His cabinet is provided with an iron door and a lock with a key of the most complex make. At his death, the heir tried to open the door, but the key refused to open, there being some special handling besides the difficulty of the lock. The man who had made the key was dead, and the case was so hopeless that the heir was forced to enter Sieur de Limville's cabinet through an opening in the wall. Inside the cabinet there was found among a mass of cobwebs a dirty sack filled with the precious medals, the collection to which the deceased had given his whole life. La Bruyère tells of a man who spent all his years hunting for a bad etching of callot. 
he knew the work was the poorest ever done by the artist, that it was not worth the trouble, but nevertheless gave his whole time and activity to the search for that etching because it was the only work of Callot that he did not possess. Jacob Spoon, a doctor of medicine and an intelligent but odd individual who died in the year 1685, declares that in his native city of Lyon everyone is collecting something or other. Then, and perhaps as a physician he was in a position to know, he says that collecting is a disease, contagious though not fatal. There is no need of special documents to say that faking must have worked with a special ease in such a world. Brienne tells us that when Cardinal Mazarin received objects from Italy, Yabak and Magnard were charged to examine them, and very often more than one piece of faking was discovered. Very successful counterfeits. Memoir de Brienne, chapter 9. There is no instance, to my knowledge, of any sentence passed by tribunal upon fakers at this time when everything seems to have been decided by the almighty power of Louis the Fourteenth or the ever-ready Parliament. Yet the police of Louis the Fourteenth seem to have one interest in the collecting of art. They must watch that the books, prints and paintings, etc., offered for sale contain nothing immoral or what we should call nowadays subversive. By this duty, the police of Louis XIV became specialists, going in chiefly for medals. In the year 1696, Pontchartrain wrote to Monsieur de la Reine to send a man to watch the sale of Abbe Bizot and to be on the lookout for the médaille encelant of the said cabinet. After other injunctions, he then adds, It is His Majesty's wish that the medals incurring suppression should be put into a sack, this to be sealed and taken to the mint. It is clear from this that over and above interest in bad coins and fake medals, the police of the Roy Soleil were on the lookout for a particular historical coin bearing some unfriendly allusion to the King of France, and their earnest efforts to suppress it had naturally made it so rare that it kindled the ambition of numismatists and collectors at large. The 18th century might be called the period of sales of art collections. Everywhere auctions were held of well-known collections. In Holland alone we can register 185 catalogues of art sales from 1700 to 1750. This may be called a sort of record, however, as France in the same period of time counts only 30 catalogues. Following the art sales in Paris, we find that from 1751 to 1760, an average of four sale catalogues a year is reached. From 1761 to 1770, the average increases to 13. From 1771 to 1775 to 28. And from 1776 to 1785 to 42 each year. This is the climax. At this point, art sales were social functions and the auction room a place where society met. Collections were dispersed and new ones formed, and the transference of masterpieces from one collection to another through the auction room acquires unusual rapidity. Such a state of affairs inspires Thibaudou with the following reflection, Thibaudou, préface du trésor de la curiosité. It is like a game of shuttlecock, in which the bourgeoisie and nobility throw masterpieces to each other, and with such swiftness that one really does not know to whom they belong. The 18th century, from the very beginning, numbers collectors such as Crozat, who had a palace in Rue Richelieu, and a collection of 19,000 drawings, 400 paintings, and 1,400 cameos, etc. Comtesse de Verrou and Bordelais. The Duke of Orleans Gallery contains 478 paintings, of which three were by Leonardo da Vinci, 15 by Raphael, 31 by Titian, 19 by Paul Veronese, 10 by Correggio, 12 by Poussin, and many others of the Dutch, Spanish and other schools. This collection of the Duke of Orleans, one of the finest in France after that of Cardinal Mazarin, seems to have been pursued by the same ill luck as the latter. The regent's son, with deplorable prudery, destroyed all the paintings with nude figures. As for the rest of the collection, it was sold later to some English amateurs by Philippe Egalité. End of chapter 11